very challenging uh, topic to tackle and people ask me why, but if all of us would be running busy neurophysiological clinics or sessions, we would come across the odd request of asking us how to localize the lumbosacral plexopathy. And if you see this, when you see this request, my heart often sinks. So, this is my declarations. So today, I will just briefly talk about a, some aspects of the lumbar, lumbar or lumbar sacral plexus. Again, you see the difficulty in the nomenclature and the anatomical aspect as well. And also, uh, just summarize the clinical features, electrophysical approaches, but most particularly, the techniques of localization and the controversy, the difficulties and challenges, which is essentially what my uh, title of my talk is, and, and eventually we'll make some conclusions to the best that of our, our, what we can do. So as you can see, the lumbar plexus or lumbar sacral plexus, depending on what the source is, often uh, in a simplistic way, you can say that it's a combination of the lumbar and sacral plexus, but as you can see, it's not very, very simple. Sometimes you can say that they are uh, joined by the lumbosacral trunk. And the nerve roots, again, depending on the source, a little bit of variation, but by and large, you can see it's L2 to L4, and then a bit of overlap, and then S1 to S4, okay? So there are some uh, contributions to the sacral uh, innovations as well. So this is, um, why is there a lot of difficulty in, in, in um, localization? Okay, the, the caveat is that the EMG, uh, classical EMG looking at paraspinal EMG, uh, sparing of paraspinal denervation may not hold true for various reasons. Uh, it really depends on when you do the EMG, uh, whether there are confounding factors like previous lumbar surgery or uh, previous uh, 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 issues uh, like diabetes, metabolic disorders, radiation, uh, and also the we often want to uh, demonstrate postganglionic uh, involvement in plexus, but this is not as simple in the lumbar plexus or lumbar sacral plexus compared to the brachial plexus. Up to 40% of the L5, at least L5 that we know of the dorsal root ganglion may have an intraspinal location. Up to 40% is quite a lot. And there's a potential confounder for the preservation of uh, these sensory responses, uh, and and also the it is a potential compounder of uh, preservation of superficial peroneal uh, sensory responses in L5 radiculopathy, which may also coexist. And sometimes the lumbar sacral plex, plex, plexopathy may uh, have simultaneous root and nerve lesions as well, and even lesions on the other side. Okay, you see that. And finally, uh, we re, we make the assumption eventually that, that MRI may be the most appropriate modality. You can challenge me on that. Uh, and may eventually turn out to be a reference uh, value comparing uh, electrophysiological and clinical methods. Okay, that is, uh, the, that is what I want to say about the introduction. Um, the anatomy, I told you, um, it's quoted as high as uh, T12 and as low as L3 to S3 and even S4, depending on the source that you quote, all right? So the, the simpler way is that uh, it, it is a combination of the lumbar and the sacral plexus joined by the lumbar sacral trunk. And unfortunately, many nerve roots come out and connect to this, including the femoral nerve. The saphenous nerve, which I'll elaborate on, it is a large sensory branch of the femoral nerve combination of the femoral nerve. Uh, the lateral femoral cutaneous nerve, the ones that you have in the neuralgia parasthetica, uh, then other sensory nerves that you can attempt to measure eventually, including the posterior femoral cutaneous nerve, medial femoral cutaneous nerve, very difficult. Uh, and it also includes a sciatic, uh, even all the way down to the pudendal nerve, which, which often not really, really affected, often in clinically. So this is uh, one uh, diagram that you will see uh, that uh, you can remember, but I can tell you, compared to the brachial plexus, it's a lot more difficult, okay? For well, first day of medical school, when I wanted to learn the anatomy of brachial plexus, fortunately it wasn't the lumbar plexus. It's, it's very complicated. Okay, so um, usually patients who come in with lumbar cervical plexopathy have a symmetrical presentation, but one of the confounding, one of the confusing aspects is that it could be asymmetric. Sometimes it can be as simple as just a foot drop, 
or sometimes it can be very patchy. It could be a very overlapping kind of muscle, uh, my, my, my own, uh, muscle weakness and, and sensory features. Uh, pain could be present, maybe a ballpark feature, 40-50%, right? And it is essential to, important to ask about hidden medical and surgical history. And that will give you a lot of information even before you start imaging or do the nerve conduction studies on EMG, all right? There are descriptions of autonomic features as well in some forms of lumbar sacral plexopathy, including inflammatory causes of lumbar sacral plexopathy. And in, this might be uh, related, I don't know, but it may be related to some of the parasympathetic sympathetic outflow to the innovation of the bladder and the bowel in the lower sacral uh, representations. Right. So the mechanisms in general, nothing very, very uh, different not even, uh, as compared to brachial plex plexopathy. But one thing I want to mention is that often we cannot be sure whether they are directly the plexus and hence the term radiculoplexoneuropathy. And again, the bilateral involvement, if it can be sequential, that means consecutive, comes later or comes early, comes later, it's actually a confusing factor as well. So we have to bear that in mind. So nerve conduction often uh, includes this kind of, it depends on where, where, where you, what kind of techniques you are comfortable with, what kind of normal control values you have. Uh, but in general, these, this is what you do. And we make, sometimes you make a side-to-side -side comparison limit of 50% compared to the other side, particularly of the sensory nerve action potential, right? And you just you need to bear in mind that normal sensory nerve potential does not exclude lumbar sacral plexopathy for various reasons I've mentioned earlier. And in, in some centers, you can, uh, in old studies, uh, like James Dick, uh, he did the autonomic testing as well to, to add to his um, support his diagnosis. So this is just to remind you that the dorsal root ganglion, the postganglionic involvement, uh, sensory nerve action potentials may not hold true as compared to the brachial plexus in cervical root uh, plexus lesions. Uh, because of the variable location of the dorsal root ganglion in the lumbar, in the lumbar segments. Uh, this is something that uh, has been shown time and again. And electromyography, uh, often uh, the localization is uh, similar to root lesions. We have two different nerves, two different muscles, uh, by two different nerves involved. However, uh, the paraspinals may be reflect affected as well, or a radicular plexopathy. And um, sometimes you might want to find, uh, you might want to look at early findings of fast firing MTs, absence of spontaneous activity. You might want to do that if, you are, if your request comes early or request comes late, you might find uh, other changes, including uh, long duration polyphasic MEPs, early innovation. Yeah. Uh, and, but EMG itself, uh, not uh, just one of the aspects of, of uh, helping you to localize lumbar sacral plexopathy. Okay, so, so other investigations, including blood tests, that's quite routine. Uh, nowadays, we can do genetic tests to uh, exclude uh, uh, forms of neuropathy, not plexopathy yet, neuropathy. Nerve biopsies have been described, uh, nothing uh, very much except that there are inflammatory changes. And for the interesting uh, history of radiation to the pelvic region, very important history, there are also descriptions, rare, rare descriptions of uh, involvement of the uh, kind of neurovascular involvement as the underlying mechanism in the pathogenesis of, of these lesions. Right? So, of course, uh, we would love to do ultrasound in the brachial plexus. I've seen very demonstrated elegantly. Uh, but for the lumbar plexus, uh, there are extremely few studies that I'm aware of, uh, but MRI, at least in two studies, have trump trumped the suitability as the most uh, kind of perhaps gold, maybe silver standard for localizing uh, lumbar sacral plexus. So the, these are the references, one in 2007 and one in 2021. Uh, and there are emerging methods, including uh, uh, MR neurography, which haven't found very much usage 
until today. Uh, so we look at that uh, very uh, eagerly, right? So what are the causes, uh, apart from the usual causes that we remember, including tumors, radiation, trauma, um, uh, it could come very quickly, like an acute injury. It could be subacute, like a neurologic amyotrophy involving the lower limbs, right? Or what we call uh, brachial plexus or lumbosacral plexus, so the inflammatory nature could be very chronic, it comes later, including radiation plexopathy, right? And this radiation plexopathy can come years after radiation. But just want to draw in mind the peculiar uh, in, uh, aspect, which is this syndrome of Bruns Garland syndrome, or what we call diabetic amyotrophy, lots of names. And you can imagine why they're not some names, because the localization is very uncertain. And that's where electrophysiology, imaging, everything has to come together. And this occurs in diabetic patients. And these patients do not really have bad, badly controlled diabetes. Many of them have very good controlled diabetes. But because of the inflammatory nature of diabetes itself, not due to chronic high sugar values, but actually due to the inflammation involved, they develop this, uh, for whatever reason we don't know, this bruns garland syndrome or diabetic myotrophy. So don't scold your patients for not looking after their diabetes if they develop the diabetic amyotrophy. Okay, so during COVID-19, we, we had a lot of time, so we looked at uh, what is the best way to tackle this problem. And we published this recent paper in the Canadian Journal uh, making an assumption that MRI is the most appropriate method for uh, evaluating lumbosacral plexopathy as a reference. And we looked at eight patients who had lumbosacral plexopathy, who were MRI positive, and reviewed the electrophysiology, including the sensory nerve conductions, which may add weight to the diagnosis. And we came to the conclusion that the saphenous nerve conduction, which I'll show a bit later, has the highest yield in MRI positive lumbosacral plexopathy. So if you can be bothered to do the nerve conduction of the saphenous nerve, you might get a little bit more inclination. So, in this particular series that we published in the Canadian Journal, uh, these patients have unilateral leg weakness, uh, variable sensory symptoms. Uh, we determine the criteria. They must have MRI evidence of lumbosacral plexopathy, uh, denervation in particular muscle groups. I know it's not perfect, but we also determined that they should have absence of denervation changes in the lumbar sp paraspinal EMG and no other diagnosis at that particular moment to suggest other causes of lumbosacral plexopathy. And to our uh, delight, 88% of the patients had abnormalities of the saphenous nerve compared to the other commonly used nerves, uh, in the superficial peroneal nerve, the sural nerve. And in three patients, actually, only the saphenous nerve abnormalities were present. And two of the patients had abnormal side-to-side -side amplitude ratios we used 50% arbitrarily. So in this particular series, the MRI showed a multitude of causes, tumors, hematoma, abscess. One patient had contrast and uh, enhancement uh, in the plexus, uh, and also uh, T2-weighted sequence changes in two patients uh, Cordial equina enhancement was also detected as proximal as the cordial equina. And um, another patient showed hyper intense signals in the gluteus, gluteal muscles, perhaps as a consequence of denervation. Right? So you can see that uh, the causes here are presumably inflammatory after an ankle fracture or fall. Uh, one patient, we can't find a reason. Another patient had tumor, uh, schwannoma, trauma, uh, diabetic plexopathy or amyotrophy, uh, and leukemia with hematoma, bleed into the plexus, and abscess from intravenous drug abuse. So this is one patient, this is a 65-year-old lady, and she had very nice MRI, all right? Try doing ultrasound in this area, it's not easy. But MRI, we're able to show the signal changes in a patient with diabetes. 
And this is a patient who came with a very relentless foot drop. I'm still treating her. The MRI changes were actually in the quarter equina. So this is a saphenous nerve conduction study. It's not difficult to do if you practice, but you must make sure that the foot mustn't be really, really fat. So um, you can get very reproducible potentials uh, and we has a certain diagnostic, additional to the diagnostic value of what you've uh, done so far. So why is the saphenous nerve a bit better? Perhaps it's L3, L4 innovation carries large fiber sensory efferents of various proportions and these contributions uh, may have resulted in a larger dermatobal rep representation compared to the other nerve, the, the sural nerve and the, <coughs> and the superficial peroneal nerve. <coughs> it is um, difficult with MRI to, to, in combination with nerve conduction, to tell exactly where the site of involvement is, but you, the sensory changes actually give you a little bit more inclination to those changes you see on MRI. The, and then finally, um, the use of the surfaceness uh, of the surface nerve in radiculopathy <coughs> is a potential confounder. But we did find a large study comprising 100, more than 100 patients with lumbar plexopathy, uh, lumbar radiculopathy with herniated discs, um, and none of them had the involvement of the of this. Safinas nerve, and that paper kind of saved us, right? Maybe it saved me for to get it published. Okay, finally, radiation plexopathy. Look for EMG myokemia. Be patient. Put a needle in, in and out, and, and 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 listen and wait and listen for these EMG myokemic changes. You can you can look at it on YouTube. There are a lot of examples of EMG myokemia on YouTube, and often demonstrated in the break up upper upper limb muscles, but it can also be seen on lower limb muscles occasionally in radiation plexopathy. Sometimes you can see CRDs, complex repetitive discharges. These can, should be differentiated from myotonia or myotonic, EMG myotonic discharges. It's a very abrupt, very fast, and very abrupt beginning and very abrupt ending potentials that are rarely seen but can be helpful. But they're not diagnostic in itself. And myotonia, which sometimes can be a confounder, very variable amplitude, fast firing, uh, variable frequency potentials uh, that we used to say dive bomber, but it could be a little bit less in the spectrum of uh, involvement. Myotonia can be demonstrated. Okay, I come to the end of my talk very quick, quickly, just to say that these plexopathies, including lumbar sacral plexopathy, they are very patchy, asymmetric. Do not follow classic dem demarcations in the presentation. Uh, Electrodiagnosis is but an adjunct to clinical imaging and blood tests. Uh, but in a situation where we don't have anything better, it is better than nothing. Uh, nerve conduction studies demonstrating post ganglionic involvement is, can be challenging in this particular part of our anatomy. Uh, but it has certain value. EMG is perhaps less of localizing value, and proximal sampling, including the paraspinals, have inherent pitfalls. Uh, high free, high, high, ampli high uh, intensity motor root stimulation is difficult in the lumbar plexus uh, to look for conduction block as compared to the brachial plexus plexopathy. There are certainly other emerging uh, tests, uh, including ultrasound, MRI, um, MRN, neurography but each comes with costs uh, versus benefits. And does it uh, actually change our treatment plans? That remains to be seen. Okay, thank you very much for your attention. I think I've come to the end of my talk.